All right, so uh, we're gonna spend three hours today with a half hour break discussing uh, specifically uh, a problem that comes up in ITCTA all the time, but it doesn't just come up in ITCTA, it comes up in child psychiatry departments, child welfare systems, all kinds of places, which is kids who for whatever reasons are engaging in um, behavior that's, that for some, in some way is not good for themselves or others. And of course that's a very broad category. And sometimes what kids are doing are actually not as bad as what the people evaluating them think they're doing. So we sometimes get hyper punitive responses to what is just playful, youthful exuberance. However, there's no question that if you think back on, over your caseload, there have been times when you have, uh, have uh, dealt with people who were self-injurious in some way, and that self-injurious behavior probably produced great distress in you. Uh, and examples of that would be being cut on, uh, being uh, pouring acid on your face or holding uh, uh, lemon juice in your eyes or in your mouth or burning yourself, those kinds of things. And we're gonna to refer to those as self-injury. Uh, the, there are two ways in which we could address this issue. And I think we finally decided to narrow it down just to self-injurious behavior. You see that the first slide is risky and compulsive behavior, uh, but that actually takes like five or six hours to do. And it's about everything from self-injurious behavior to binging and purging to uh, compulsive sexual behavior to uh, compulsive shoplifting and uh, buying to uh, impulsive aggression to suicidality. Uh, it covers quite a few categories. And basically what we've been able to do is show scientifically that uh, an awful lot of those avoidance strategies all have in common certain parameters uh, that make it a little frustrated for you. But on the other hand, this perspective allows you to see why they're probably doing it because the danger that we have so our countertransference is most likely to be activated in situations where we don't feel we can do anything to help the situation. Unfortunately, a lot of the quote acting out of adolescence, there are no good theoretical models to explain why they're doing what they're doing. And a lot of the ones that are there are pejorative. So you get op oppositional defiant conduct disorder, baby borderline, all the terms we use for people who engage in these behaviors. And uh, you know, some of us have written pretty detailed analyses of what's wrong with that approach. Among other things, it becomes very circular. You say someone's a borderline because they cut on themselves. You say, why do they cut on themselves? You say, because they're a borderline. And not only have you gone in a circle with no more positive outcome for how you can t intervene, you've also managed to now pathologize the situation more. So then when you're the next client and, and this therapist says, intensely borderline young woman with proclivity for self-injury, you're gonna go, well, I don't know, maybe, I'll, maybe someone else could take that case. So, but I would like to offer you a different perspective that comes from many years of work in my own uh, field, but also an awful lot of research in this area, and we'll talk about some of it, that these behaviors that get you in trouble, we're gonna call them distress reduction behaviors or DRBs, some of you heard that from last week, are actually the mind's attempt to, uh, this, the, the mind, the organism, the person's attempt to find the highest level of functioning and coping possible, given that they're in a very difficult circumstance. The very difficult circumstances, what we'll be talking about today and notable for that difficult circumstances is not visible. In other words, people who are walking around with the precursors to engaging in self-injurious behavior, other behaviors, look fine until they get triggered and engage in that behavior. So part of what we have to do is see if we can figure out what's going on before they cut, figure out why they want to cut, figure out what they can do instead of cutting, and that will lead us to a much better place. Um, in general, there'll always be a client that will challenge you that. But the, 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 the overall goal I would have for you potentially would be in the future when your client is cutting on themselves, and we're just gonna focus on cutting today. When they cut on themselves, uh, what could you do about it? Because if you think about it, Think about your own cases where that's happened. Haven't you felt responsible for that? Like, my, I'm making my client cut on themselves. I'm not conducting myself well enough. Even your fellow therapist may ask you with great 
you know, sadness. Oh, do you have someone who's a cutter? Oh, that's too bad. There's an implication maybe you're not handling it well. Some of us worry about liability. You know, if this person keeps cutting on themselves, sometimes psychiatric hospitals seem like they're necessary and that opens up a whole new bag of concerns and stuff. But I think where it grabbed most of us is the fact that self-injurious behavior is actually very functionally autonomous. It works on its own. It has functions. It, it works. So when we try to stop them from using these behaviors, we're going up against what they would say would be their most effective uh, procedure. So a lot of what today is going to be about, if we could get rid of the martial aspects of it, would be this is a version of jujitsu which is instead of going up against the client's defenses and fighting with them and argue with them what they do, what we're going to try to do is take a phenomenological perspective where we try to figure out why they actually need to do those things so that we can intervene in that need. What, what, what is producing the problem? Can we fix the problem? What kinds of solutions are they using? Are they the best ones? Are they the safest ones? Do they, in fact, reinforce the problem? And in that way, this gets very, very pragmatic and allows you to move forward in a more direct way. Also, because you're not going to be saying any time today, and hopefully with your clients, that they've done something wrong when they cut it themselves. And maybe some of us think of it right now, but hopefully by the end of the day, we'll see that what they're doing is the best they can do, given the hand they've been dealt. Once we can convey that, then the shame and the blame tends to drop a lot and the quality of the therapeutic relationship, the alliance, improves because as you're going to see, I'm never going to be saying to someone in the three hours today, oh, you said you wouldn't cut on yourself, but you did cut on yourself, you know, you're bad. Just for an example, we'd probably say, well, uh, you know, we didn't tell you you couldn't cut on yourself. We said to, to try to not if you can, and if you have to do it for as little as you need to. And you know that's quite a different statement because it may mean that you come back cut, but you came back, you did do what you're supposed to do. You tried not to as long as you could, and then you do it as little as possible. Now what you have is someone who's coming back with a success instead of a failure. I'm just trying to uh, tell you how it might frame differently when you look at it from that perspective. So uh, let's just look at the major forms of self-injury. How many of you have had a client who, look at this page here for a second, this slide. How many of you have had a client who engaged in at least once of those behaviors at some point in your work? Okay, about half. Uh, by the way, do, you, do the other half think that your clients don't self-injure? You know, it's just up for grabs. The problem is that some people make visible their cuts partially because they may be wanting to make an impact on the therapeutic process or get attention they feel they're not needing. I don't mean just trying to get attention like that's a discount, but like saying, I'm not feeling enough empathic attunement from you. I don't feel that you're caring about me enough, et cetera. Those people are sharing, but probably one of the biggest take-homes we have in the kind of populations that you probably treat is that a substantial number of the people you think aren't cutting on themselves or burning on themselves actually are. They're just not telling you anything about it. A very common phenomenon is for people to burn themselves in the insides of their arms or their legs or on their torso where it's not going to be visible with clothing. So, you know, I, I want you to be gentle here, but if you can find, you might just ask your so-called non-cutting person if they're actually cutting. Because there are downsides to cutting, it can disfigure, but it can also produce infection. Uh, it can also actually produce disability if you cut a vein or a, a muscle that shouldn't be cut. And it even theoretically, supposedly we hear about cases where people died from self-injury because like they caught a, cut an artery when they weren't planning to, or they, um, you know, they did something to, they swallowed something that they thought would, we see this in psych hospitals, they swallow, uh, you know, a sharp, ob, some razor blades, which is, can be a form of self-injury. Unfortunately, then what they have is razor blades in their abdomen cutting loose everything, and you, you can die from that stuff. So compared to some distress reduction behavior, self-injury is not likely to produce death, but it can produce serious injury. And it can also produce disfigurement that maybe the client's willing to accept when they're 18 and feeling horrible about themselves because they feel like it's congruent with their internal states. But what happens to a lot of people when they get better and they no longer have that drive to scarify themselves or make themselves be cut, you've still got the scars. So this could be a real problem. So this is part of why we want to keep them when they're not doing so well to keep from disfiguring themselves so much so that later they won't have so much to ha deal with. You know, this was true for tattooing to some extent, although I'm not saying tattooing is part of, of, uh, of self-injury. And you can ask me more about that. 
But, uh, you know, the belief in the early days was, well, if people tattoo, then later when they've grown out their youthful exuberant, they're going to be walking around with tattoos everybody, everywhere and everybody will make fun of them. Luckily, our culture did a much more clever, diverse thing. It just allowed people to have tattoos as adults. So now your bank teller could have a tattoo, right? Your physician could have a tattoo because there was a normative quality there. So there's something where even though you did something that maybe you think later you shouldn't have done, there's not a lot of problems for it. But cutting when you have you know, the rest of your life, you've got a f scars on your face or on your arms or other things can be much more serious. The most severe version of this, and uh, I just want to mention it, but it, it's, the, it's not classic self-injury is every couple of years in psych hospitals, we will have someone who is delusional and believes they have to cut their tongue off to keep speaking the word of Jesus or something, or, or to say to people what they know about things. And then they respond positively to antipsychotics. And now what they are, are people who are online again, but they have no more tongue. Now don't think about that too much. It's an awful icky story, but it is the effects of severe self-injury lasting longer. So a lot of times when we're working with these patients, you know, you may want to put them in a psych hospital and maybe sometimes they belong there if it's, you're trying to stop something really bad. But the reality is that, that uh, most self-injurious behavior is not good. It has a lot of downsides, but it, it will not be catastrophic. If you do start to see it become catastrophic, then that would be the time to consider your hospitalization. So the things you see here are the primary forms of self-injury. Uh, the cutting of the torso at extremities is by far the most common. Um, what we see in the young kids sometimes is they start by cutting themselves, by scratching themselves with their nails. Then they use paper clips or pieces of glass, and they usually graduate to uh, razor blades. And the higher they go up at that, the more damage obviously they can do. Although I have heard some people are in self-injury, they're very much aficionados of self-injury and they'll comment on the various self-cutting ways and the benefits and, and downsides of each. So the argument for razor blades are, you can do more damage, but the scars themselves are thinner. So people that don't want big scars, they like that. People that want big scars are probably gonna use something else, often uh, broken pieces of glass. Um, why do they go to glass, by the way? A lot of times people with self-injury started out with an acting out distress reduction behavior, like trying suicide or punching their fist through a wall or a window or something. At that point, what some of them discover is they feel an awful lot better, which is the beginnings of this cycle wherein self-injury can actually be a solution to emotional distress. It's a solution with massive downsides, but it can actually be there. By the way, if you've heard about contagion, where in a group home, two kids cut and then three more cut and then five cut, the usual analysis is, well, all those kids are just trying to be popular. There's probably a little of that going on, but, but if you look at actually all the kids who do cut, what you'll find is that some don't cut at all. Some cut just once and some cut a lot and we call the ones that cut a lot, we say that this is con contagion, right? It's spread. But in reality, if you buy from the beginning here, the notion that self-injury is actually a coping response, we'll have to explain how it works, but a coping response for traumatized individuals who are overwhelmed by trauma-related distress, if that's true, then uh, the different behaviors that they use uh, may serve different functions. They may actually have, there may be some advantages of engaging in some behaviors and not engaging in other behaviors. So the cutting of the torso and the extremities is going to be uh, the, the most popular methodology. There's two general ways we see this. The split is usually people who cut under their clothes and people who cut outside of their clothes. How many of you have had people who cut, the only reason you know they've cut is they told you because they don't, you can't see anything in their clothes. So a good nurse. How many of you have had clients who cut themselves very visibly? Some of the same people. Yeah, welcome to that world. I had a client in Canada, in Winnipeg, who uh, I saw for a very long time, and she was electively mute, so it was kind of hard to do verbal psychotherapy on her. But she would come into each session with a crisp white blouse. She'd go into the waiting room, and then she would cut herself with razor blades and splat, uh, smear the her blouse with all this red and then she would just sit there pert and prim and sitting there just like everything's fine waiting for me to come get her to bring her into her, to the office and a part of this was actually we worked out over the years she was trying to punish me by having saying to the other patients or clients look at how bad my therapist is 
but the other part of it was probably to uh, to communicate despair and distress. So sometimes where the cut is will really make quite a difference in terms of, of what's actually being done. Burning uh, used to be much more popular. You don't see it so much anymore. Burning uh, was what before? Cigarettes mostly. How many of you are old enough to have had clients who burnt themselves with cigarettes? Or if any of you had clients burnt themselves with cigarettes? So, you know, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that was the primary form of self-injury was burning. In psych hospitals, you'd see it everywhere. Uh, what happened? Cigarettes went out of vogue and you can't, you can't smoke in psych hospitals very much. And you, so that basically people don't have as many ways in which they can burn themselves. You will still see it though, of course. And in the more ex extreme versions, you see people burn themselves, um, not using, I, if you get triggered in this, please let me know. I'm trying not to trigger you too much, but some of this is sad to hear, but some people will actually use matches or blow torches or other things to literally burn themselves. That's probably different than cigarette burning, which is just using the embers. When you see that more severe stuff, uh, as I'll mention to you later, you want to be more worried about the possibility of psychosis, extreme intoxication, mania, uh, or some pretty severely debilitating state. But most burning will be, uh, will be uh, burning with cigarette butts. The other one that comes in here sometimes is self-scalding. So you're burning yourself with very hot water. Uh, and then there's a subtype for some people burn themselves with acid. And uh, this one, some people want to put that in another category than burning, but it is pretty much just burning. Putting acid in your eyes, putting it in your mouth, putting it on your skin, not very common. If, if you do see your client started out with low level cutting and they're starting to migrate to these higher levels, that would be when you'd want to seek out a consultation because obviously for whatever reason, their original avoidance response isn't paying off, so they're upping the ante. It will probably at some point they'll get something that's more powerful, but it'll also be more, more dangerous for them. And that's something we want to kind of avoid. Self-stabbing or piercing. Uh, some people have included that in cutting, but it's obviously different. Uh, this is some, we see them in the emergency room. People stab themselves in the stomach with a knife or something. This is also where we sometimes see auto surgery. If you've heard of that, people will actually cut themselves open and try to manipulate their internal parts. If you do see that, uh, that's again, be looking more at psychosis, mania, and highly agitated intoxication states like sometimes from methamphetamine or other kinds of things. Uh, piercing is kind of interesting because this include nipple piercing, labia piercing, ear piercing. We generally don't include body art as we could call it or tattoos as part of self-injurious behavior because self-injurious behavior is typically uh, self-affected bodily harm of a socially appropriate nature. Self-affected means you did it to yourself. Bodily harm means you did something, it hurt you. But socially appropriate means you're, you're I mean, a socially inappropriate nature. So what it means is you're not doing it just because other people are doing it. You're doing it because it has some function for you. So as I mentioned, that group of people who are, who are in, the, in the group home, who some of the people are cutting and some aren't, it's because the the people that never tried it just never tried it. The people who tried it and did it just once, which is very common, by the way, who are they? They're probably the people that won't have the psychological dynamics we'll be describing. And we're doing it to be popular or to be with the group or to quote, get attention, et cetera. But what was their problem? Why did they only do it once? Because whatever was driving them was just to feel pain and be like the in crowd. The people who are cutting themselves for the reasons we'll talk about today are actually trying to take away pain. But if you don't have the underlying psychological, biological problems, when you cut on yourself, what happens? What would happen to most of you guys if you did a nice cut across your inner arm? You'd hurt. And so you'd be punished for recutting your arm, right? But what if you were besieged by difficult difficulties and you had intrusive memories and problems? We'll get into it more. And when you cut on yourself, the minute you did it, you felt calm and peace. Now you'd want to cut on yourself. So probably, so the argument that sometimes school systems or governments try to say with me is that this contagion effect means the kids are just doing it because they're trying to be cool. And they're confusing the, the by the way, the, the uh, tattooing and body art with cutting and they're, they're separate things. But what you wanna ask them is how many of those kids who were in the contagion are still 
two months later still cutting on themselves. Well, who are those people? Those are people who got helpful hints from their colleagues about how to regulate their distress. They probably would have done it anyway, but they figured it out faster. So when you're in, if you're in a group home or a, a residential setting and you see that stuff, uh, I don't have brilliant things to say to you, but, but, and you can do all the things we'll talk about today, but remember there's probably three groups in there, the ones who wouldn't do it, the ones who would do it, but not for homeostatic reasons, and they stop, and the ones who would have done it anyway. Uh, Self-biting or chewing, uh, usually biting the inside of the mouth or chewing on, on, on fingers or parts of the body. Now, does this include chewing on your cuticles? Chewing the, your knuckles? Chewing the inside of your mouth when you're really mad? Well, you know, it's all up for grabs and we do, we, different surveys use different things. I would just say that self-biting or chewing is probably self-injurious when it's especially obviously a constant behavior that's being used to reduce distress. So if you chew on your nails every single day and rip your cuticles and you have red nails, you probably are engaging in a self-injurious behavior. It's a fairly low one, but you probably are. If you uh, are biting the inside of the mouth till you bleed, if you're uh, chewing on your hands or arms, I have seen, again, because I work in emergency context, I've seen people who are actually chewing at their flesh. That would be an example of that as well. By the way, the chances of infection and, and illness are very high in those kinds of situations. Picking at wounds and scabs, which by the way, is sometimes not included in self-injury. It's included, it's called self-excoriation. Have you heard of that term? That means that you're taking a wound that's already healing or that there's some kind of lesion there. It could be a lump. It could be a, a scratch. It could be a scab. It could be a pimple. And you just keep pip picking at it until it starts to bleed, till it, it gets large and potentially gets affect infected. Uh, ex excoriation, you may not have seen too much, but it's really actually a pretty bad one because when we see people coming with excoriation, their arms and legs are just lots of red marks picked on spots everywhere, healing scabs, etc. Also, some people who cut on themselves or burn themselves will develop scabs. They'll then pick the scabs later. So what you have then is a combination of cutting and then excoriation or picking later. Head banging uh, isn't always in everybody's list of self-injurious behaviors, but it should be. Um, this is where people hit them, their heads pretty hard in an attempt to disrupt painful internal states by inducing some kind of painful state. The problem with head banging is some people have actually given themselves concussions. Uh, you know, it's not probably that great of an idea. It's also a little primitive. And I don't like to use the word primitive except to say some behaviors are based on very basic things that maybe really need to be addressed, like self-hatred as opposed to just trying to reduce your distress. Um, men tend to headbang more than women, so what you'll find is in studies that didn't include headbanging as a self-injurious behavior, you'd be more likely to hear that women self-injure more than men. We've done now two large studies. This is the Breer and Gill study and the Breer and, uh, and uh, Edie study. Those two studies were large studies where we looked at large amounts of cutting with using multivariate statisticians. And what we found was when you controlled for everything, there were no differences between men and women in the extent to which they injured. But what was noteworthy was they injured under different conditions to some extent, and they used different methodologies often. So men are gonna pound walls, punch windows, hit their heads. They're gonna exercise until they're quite ill or, or have to go to the hospital sometimes. They're gonna do those kinds of behaviors. Women are gonna do more of the, of the cutting, the burning, the self-stabbing and the picking. Punching or hitting oneself generally doesn't work too well, uh, but it is obviously a form of that. And when you're looking at people whose uh, avoidance strategies are coming perhaps from other things like uh, autism spectrum stuff. So usually when people engage in what we'll talk about today, it's because they have more, a lot of trauma and very little emotional regulation. I'm just mentioning that. We, don't, we haven't built up the concept yet. But we do know that, for instance, kids on the autism spectrum may engage in what used to be called atavistic behavior, punching their heads. That's why they have to wear some of them football helmets and stuff. So for those people, head banging is actually the methodology that they're using. They're hitting themselves, they're banging their heads. Um, so what we typically find is head banging and uh, punching and hitting oneself may come from intellectual disabilities or, or emotional processing deficits that are organic. 
uh, they can show up in a, in a number of different contexts. It doesn't mean you won't find that in self-injury, but that we tend to see that as more on its own category. And then they're just the more extreme behaviors. And this is the, don't get freaked out, but these are the things that some people do. So there's, there's auto surgery and auto surgery, uh, literally people will lay on a bed, for example, with a mirror on the ceiling and they will have surgical equipment and they will actually open up their bodies while they're watching the mirrors. And then at some point, usually things go awry and they call 911, 911. So, and I've, because it's sort of my area, I've probably been involved in maybe 10 cases of this, which is called auto surgery. Most people who do auto surgery are medical professionals, most typically nurses in my experience. But the last big case I dealt with was a plastic surgeon who was doing operations on his stomach. Um, probably a little psychotic, but I can't say much about him, uh, but he, uh, his stomach required all kinds of metal mesh to hold his guts in and stuff because he had been cutting on his stomach so many times. That was an interesting one because uh, I was seeing him and my medical student said, I think I heard of this guy. And I, I'm like, whatever. And he goes, I'm going to Google him, okay? And so I'm working with a guy and the Google comes up. He's been to like eight surgeons. He's been on the news. He's been, But this is a guy who was in this more extreme state, which is he had some manic symptoms. He had some psychotic symptoms, and that was driving what would have been, quote, just self-injury into some pretty severe stuff. Besides auto-surgery, there's uh, eye enucleation, popping your eyes out. There's auto-amputation, cutting your arms or legs off. There's amputation of the breasts, the penis, the cutting of the labia, um, just about any of those things that you can think about. Uh, sometimes there's, for some psychotic people, they'll eat intensely eat whole bottles of glass or other kinds of things. Sometimes that motive looks a little different than what we'll be talking about today. I just want you to be aware of it. You're looking very somber and you should, but you should know that, that nine times out of 10, it's gonna be self-cutting. Then it's gonna be burning. And then is the bigger stuff, but it's not gonna be very common. The other thing you should know is that although the more severe stuff I mentioned may say there's a more severe scenario like psychosis that we're going to have to also treat. It's also true that some people who are cutting or burning and it stops working either because they inadvertently took some aspirin beforehand, believe it or not, they, you know, they took some aspirin and then cut on themselves and they're not getting the pain they want or they're very, very mad at their partner or whoever they think caused what's distressing them. So they just do, their rage feeds what they're gonna do and so they do more severe stuff. Um, that, this, this is all kind of gradations, but that's easier to deal with because they can get unangry, they can get off their anti-pain anti medicine and they may go back down to a lower level. But you know, uh, working with self-injury before we go any further, I would just say is not a job for uh, someone who doesn't have colleagues to rely on, consultation, supervision, etc. Uh, almost always self-injury, I would recommend you seek out some collegial assistance. It may be technical assistance about what should I do about this, but the other thing is that we just don't, we feel bad when our clients try to hurt themselves under our care because we feel bad about ourselves and we almost inevitably get mad at them for having the temerity to confront us with our own helplessness, right? Because we can't fix it right away. So what we're seeing is something that we feel great responsibility for and very little ability to do something about. So it's going to get us pretty angry. I mean, just prepare for that. It's going to happen. I won't ask you if you got angry at your cutters because uh, you may think that you shouldn't be angry and you shouldn't be in the sense that it interferes with anything, but it's not at all uncommon for the average clinician to feel that they're being confronted with their inadequacies when their client keeps on cutting themselves, especially if they do it in the waiting room or wherever it might be. It feels intentional, like the client is trying to screw with the therapist. There could be a teeny bit of truth to that in the sense the client may be trying to get the therapist to respond to them differently. Um, but probably the biggest advantage of having a, uh, another therapist that you can just talk to after the session is for you to normalize your responses, not to blame yourself for what it was, but to normalize it and get it under control. So the next time you see the person, you're not back into a counter-transference place. Ideally, you're back in a compassion place. And a side effect of today is if I am successful, I would imagine that one of the outcomes might be is that you, when next time you see someone doing this stuff, you're less likely to be mad and you're more likely to feel compassion because 
I'm going to suggest that these behaviors are not entirely under people's control. They're, they're driven by the circumstances of, of their lives and what's happened to them. And therefore, blaming for someone for, who really doesn't have a chance to get do what they're doing is going to be a little problematic. If you know that your client is messed up and they're just doing these behaviors, that's not going to freak you out nearly as much as if you think they're doing things to try to make you feel bad. And you can get all clinical and go, oh, well, that apparently is their personality pathology, but I will transcend that because I'm a bodhisattva, highly realized psychotherapist. But the reality is you're going to go, well, that sucks. And you're going to want to yell at your self-injuring person. Now, I know that's hardcore, but I've been doing this for a very long time. I've worked with you for a very long time. And these kinds of problems generate anger and self esteem problem. So when you feel those things, don't go, oh my God, where did that come from? But say, ah, I recognize this. Then reach out to others, both because you'll become a better therapist in the next session, but also because if you can down escalate it, then you're not churning yourself up with maybe your own triggered trauma history or your own difficulties. You want to ideally leave a consultation in sort of a goofy laughing or at least not uh, self-hating place. Uh, so for those more extreme behaviors, again, if you see the big stuff, again, here's one just very briefly, a case that I was involved in where a man pushed his wrist into a garbage disposal. Okay. Now, could he have just cut himself? He could have. So why would he want to do that? Any guess? Yeah, to make sure he felt pain. Anything else? To communicate his distress, a cry for help. You know, the, those are true, but the big one is he's, he's crazy. Now, I believe we're all crazy. I totally believe I'm crazy. So when I say crazy, don't overinterpret it. But the reality is if you're in the grips of a psychosis and you're having command hallucinations or you believe that the devil's about to get you and you have to do something to stop her from him from getting you or whatever, you're in another world. And so behaviors that seem logical or illogical get thrown out of the, out of the box. It really is sad. I've seen it handfuls of times where people have done stuff under psychosis that when they're out of psychosis and they killed somebody or they set fire to themselves, which is not that uncommon um, for some people who self-injure, is that when they're no longer psychotic, they're, now they've got burn scars, and now they're in jail, and now they've got other things. Well, that was pretty downer-ish. Do you guys have any questions about those? Or do you want to add any other potential self-injuries to that list? Because that's only a small group. Okay, let's go to the etiology because the etiology is going to be really important here in terms of, of uh, where this is coming from. So one of the things that, that you, I think you have your feet in two lands. You are both a determinist and a free willist. So you believe that people can logically choose their own behaviors. We know that a therapist, therapists generally believe that we have the capacity to independently choose behaviors, but you're also a therapist and you want to know why people do things. The minute you want to know why people do things, you're a determinist, aren't you? You're saying part of the reason why this is happening isn't due to free will, it's due to the constraints of life. Does that make sense? So where you fall in the continuum there is going to be interesting. Some people are closet determinists. Uh, we don't think there is free will. Some of us think there's free will and we have extended versions of free will so that we can even say that behavior that's not out of your control, that is out of your control, maybe you could have done something else. You know, you shot those people, maybe you could have shot yourself. I mean, you know, free will still seems like it's in there. Um, I, I want to go gently with this, but I would like to invite you to the, to the Buddhist notion of dependent origination. A dependent origination basically says that all things arise from other things. All things, causes situations, events. Nothing ex occurs spontaneously in and of itself. Nothing is empty of predetermination. Does that make sense to you? Like what the outfit you wore today, the thought you just had about me or your client or yourself, uh, whether your, your finger hurts right now, those are a million impinging things that are that are affecting you. Of course, in therapy, we want to believe in free will because we want to empower people to do things that are can be done for them. But the part of it that we have to be very careful about and that can actually help us is to realize that there's some things you can't 
go past. If someone shoots you and you have a coma, you don't have a free will to get out of the coma. If your mother was really mean to you all of your life and then your partner says something that's an exact sound of what your mother said with all of the same self-hatred, I don't think you have free will about whether you're going to be infurious. And I don't even know if you have free will about whether you're going to punch your partner or scream or break up with them or something. So again, you know, we're going to, we have to tiptoe through free will and determinism here a little bit, although I love to open it up and I have, so we can talk about it more. We don't have time to talk about it today, but part of the idea here is let's just, for you people that really believe that you have control over your own behavior, let's just say the more trauma and trauma sequels or effects of trauma are present in an individual, the reduced number of degrees of freedom they have to do anything they want to do. So basically, uh, I, before we get into the line here, the phenomenology of this is, I would say that if you uh, were hurt a lot when you were little, you can be easily triggered into rage states. Then when people remind you of your parent or they trigger you in some way, you're going to go into that rage. That's just psychology 101, right? Condition responses learning theory. And when you enter rage, you are now going to be in a destabilized state and you're going to want to do something about the rage. And it may be aggression either towards yourself because you, you're mad at yourself that this happened or aggression towards others. At that point, unless someone has helped you or unless you were lucky enough to have some moderating factors there, you don't have a lot of free will. What does that mean for us here? It means that we can't blame people so much anymore. Bless you. So if you think that if, if someone walks up to you and says, I hate your guts and they spit in your face, I'm just going to do the extreme version of this for you. You're perfectly fine to be really pissed at that. But if you were to take a dependent origination view, again, nobody would do that. I just want to compare views. What would you do when a person walked up to you and, and, and called your names and spit on your face? What would your cognitions be saying? Anyone want to say? I'll repeat what you say. What? Okay, so what's, is it what's wrong with you or what's wrong with the situation? What's happening? See, so what she said, act, what's wrong, what's bothering them, not what's wrong with you, which we love to say, right? But that goes back to a weird free will, right? You chose to do this thing. But if, if, when, if I'm in the emergency room and the guy in front of me has just uh, infected someone else with HIV and they got to tuberculosis and they're an IV drug abuser and they threatened to punch out a nurse two minutes before. Um, I honestly say to you that if I'm having a good day, I'll just think that guy's taking care of business. He's taking care of business very badly and a lot of it's going to come back and bite him, but he's just trying to survive his internal states. If I can believe that, and I know you don't necessarily believe this yet and you won't by the end, but it is a good way to think about this stuff. If I can believe that it's not entirely under your control, then I can't blame you because blame comes from free will. So is this not true? If someone completely crazily does something and you know that it wasn't that they tried to do it to you, it just happened, you don't get nearly as mad at them. If someone's on the 405 and goes across three lanes of the highway and hits you at 65 miles an hour and you hit the guardrail and then when the paramedics are bringing you out, it's going to matter how angry you are, how much you blame that person when you find out whether that person stroked out in the slow lane and just drifted across or they were aiming for you, right? There are going to be all these rules. And but how about, you know, there's a very interesting, I didn't know I'll be talking about this. This is more in another lecture, but a very interesting small group of findings showing that when people are attacked by wolves or bears or tigers, if you compare those people who have been attacked by people, the ones who have been attacked by animals rarely blame the animals for it. There's pretty dramatic examples of people who have been attacked by wolves. They don't blame the wolves. Why? Yeah, so what you're basically saying, they're not really responsible. They're doing what? They're being wolves, right? And if you're a wolf, you'll probably do these things. So then we don't blame them. And if we don't blame them, does that, interfere, does that help us with our recovery? Does it help with how we respond to people? Because if we blame you, then we are retributional. And retributional has been shown in a million studies to be bad for you. Retribution is just hitting yourself in the head and hoping you'll feel better. You know, by hitting someone else, you really have just hurt yourself. I'm not blaming us. Humans will want to be retributional. But the reality is 
that, uh, that when we get angry and when we blame, it usually tends to make things chronic and it makes it harder to go. So part of the idea when we go over this etiology in this slide, I would just invite you to think about not pathologizing or demeaning or devaluing or saying, oh, this poor head case doesn't know what they're doing, but just saying what? And some trainees of mine are sick of hearing this, but when they present the case and they'll say, what do you think? You know, uh, shot four people, uh, you know, da, 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 and now they're in the emergency room and they're freaking out. What do you think's going on? I know this sounds bad, but I would probably say it sounds like they're in a predicament. Right? I mean, because they didn't say, they didn't wake up that morning saying, I think I'll have a SWAT team pursue me down a Artesia Boulevard. What they did was this and that and this and that, which is pro unless it was thought out beforehand and it was a crime that they worked out, et cetera. But if it's an impulsive, reactive behavior, it probably wasn't really under their control. And that means that when you interact with them, you don't have to be punitive. There's whole, I won't say the name of this stuff, but there's, are there not whole psychodynamic or psychological theories that tend to blame people when they get in trouble? Don't we ascribe it to all kinds of things? That's not your friend. So if you spit in my face uh, and I was having a very good day, maybe I just came back from a 10 day Vipassana retreat, I might say to myself, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what's wrong? Because spitting in the face wasn't independently generated. It came from stuff. It came from whatever was bothering them, whatever they thought I did. And therefore, my response to them, it's perfectly logical that they would do that. Because that's what this slide will be is, cutting on yourself is perfectly logical. Then you might say, why doesn't everybody cut on themselves? Well, not everybody will have this cascade of etiologies and issues. This is sometimes called the reactive avoidance model or RAM. Uh, and I've written about that in various places recently. Um, so the first step of this is that most people who engage in self-injurious behavior, but also binge, purge, have impulsive violence, have high rates of sexual activity, uh, uh, shoplift at high levels, uh, gamble at high levels. A lot of those distress reduction behaviors tend to be found specifically in individuals who had early problems in childhood. Uh, and it's, it's kind of amazing. So if you look at every, you look at bulimia and then you look at self-cutting and then you look at high rates of sexual activity and then you look at shoplifting, they don't have a lot in common. But if you look in the literature of each of those things, you see the same variables showing up all over, but we just have never put them together. That it's actually maybe the conditions on this page would be true for cutting, but shoplifting or sexing the outcome might be affected by what's going on, but the actual intent to engage in a behavior may be common to all of these things. So um, uh, if you read a book on, that includes reactive avoidance model, it's going to give you different chapters for different kinds of problems and self-injury would be just one. But the idea that you see here will be over and over and over again. Let me tell you how extreme this is. When I went through for this previous book, when I went through maybe 10 major forms of DRVs, they all got their own chapter, they all got their own literature view about what the science said. In every single case, the reported findings for predictors of that behavior were early child abuse and neglect, especially child sexual abuse, attachment dysregulation, and emotional regulation problems. That's pretty dramatic given that these are behaviors that are quite different, you know, uh, cutting on your face and stealing a makeup kit from a store doesn't seem like it's the same thing. And there will be differences, but what's notable is that it hangs together. We, just for the nerds in the room, the stats nerds in the room, we did a form of a structural equation modeling where we had a measurement model that was specifically set up to see if it's true that you can throw all these DRBs in there and they will all operate exactly the same in a structural equation model. It's just a sort of a cheaty way to say, well, if I believe that all these things are one thing, then let's make them one thing and see what the model does. Does it still predict? Does it hold together? And in these fancy models, you get something called a goodness of fit co coefficient, which just says, nah, not working. Like two and three modified the same, but four went up, one, one, one went down. You know, 
like you cutting is up but not binging. But what happened in that model was that the, the confirmatory factor analysis, this measurement model, found that all of the distress reduction behaviors operated as a single variable, single latent variable, and they all co-varied as expected with this slide. So we can't prove anything, but it really does suggest to us that what we're talking about today is meaningful. Uh, it also has ended up being very helpful in working with traumatized adolescents because I don't know what you think, but you know, when does self-injury first start on the average kid, would you say? What? 10? Another guess? 13? Five? Okay, that's a little atypical, and I want to look at that more, um, but it's usually early adolescent during the pubescent period. Uh, so usually the onset of, of self-injurious behavior is between 11 and 13, although it's variable. Uh, I consulted on a woman who didn't cut on herself till she was 78. Uh, but I don't know if she didn't. She just didn't remember cutting on herself. Often what you'll find is people who cut on themselves, then they stop. And then later in life, when they get stressed again, they may cut on themselves again. So it's harder to know that stuff. Right now, we're getting a weird phenomenon, which is as the Vietnam veteran cohort, cohort starts to end up in homes and are starting to dement and are starting to uh, end up in the VA permanently, et cetera. What we're now finding is that anecdotally is that combat veterans are starting to cut on themselves at levels that we hadn't seen for a long time. So they were cutting, the, even combat will make you cut generally, generally it's child abuse stuff, but combat can activate early memories and cause you to feel distress. Well, then you can actually be activated by having lost your role in life or being so demented that you don't have current memories or maybe being mad that your caretaker is controlling you when you've been independent your whole life. You can watch self-injurious stuff wax and wane. Classically, in our room, in this situation, what you see an onset at uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, peak at around, and this is totally just across all kinds of cases, at around 18, 17, 18, 19, start of a decrement. And by the time you're in your 30s, almost not, no one is cutting on themselves again, unless they've been reactivated or triggered into previous behavior. But then if you hit another stressor later on, you may see a flare up, just like with PTSD. So the, the Vietnam veteran population, their PTSD is flattened down to maybe 20% in that group. But when bad things happen to them, you'll find exacerbations. So a lot of us who are trauma specialists are getting these weird requests from uh, elderly care facilities about what, we never heard about that stuff before, but now you have a whole generation of traumatized people who are being triggered in new kinds of ways. So, so part of the idea is it starts early and it fades quickly and it can wax and wane as a function of other stressors. Kind of interesting. So if we go back to that, the, the almost always what you're gonna see is the etiology, what went wrong was probably in early childhood. Now, we, our science isn't good enough to say that's always true. But if you, if you look, almost certainly clinically and in most studies, you find that the stuff we're going to talk about starts when you're two or three or four or five. So, for instance, about five years ago in the emergency room, the medical emergency room, I was called in a consult. A woman had, uh, had a car accident, fairly mild car accident, uh, but... Uh, she grabbed a piece of broken glass from the freeway and started stabbing herself and cutting herself on the freeway. Um, so this seemed to go against the rules because she was an adult with no history, supposed history of self-injurious behavior. But that would be so anomalous that we can looked at that longer and what do you think we found? What would you guess? That the person had had early trauma, early cutting, but had forgotten about that stuff, but it was sitting there waiting. And this is going to be a take home for all of today. You can't cure people very easily. Cure, you can't take things out. You can't extinguish memory. You can't prevent responses. What they say nowadays in modern uh, behavioral theory is that you can reduce the probability of a response. But the thing is still there somehow. You, if, if, even if, I, if you're afraid of dogs and we expose you to sm small friendly dogs and eventually you're not afraid of dogs anymore, you would say that your dog fear is extinguished, right? 
No, 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 no. I mean, some people would say that, but actually now we know your dog fears are still back there. It's just that you have newer learning saying dogs aren't dangerous. And the new learning is talking to the older learning, but the older learning is still there. So Krask and others have really pointed out that we can't assume that the stuff from behind will come back later. And that's exactly what can happen in this situation. Okay, so early trauma, the, the stuff here would be early trauma, child abuse and neglect, attachment disturbance in the early years. So what would that normally look like? In the field, when, when people have thought that it probably was due to early events, they almost always talked about childhood sexual abuse. And that's because child sexual abuse is one of the strongest predictors of self-injurious behavior. But let's be careful here. Many people with child abuse, sexual abuse histories do not go on to cut. And some people go on to cut don't have child sexual abuse histories because this is a model that can have a lot of interchangeable parts. But sexual abuse is so bad for you. And when it happens so early, it's going to dysregulate your attachment. It's going to dysregulate other things. And so it's going to have an oversized impact. But if I was abducted by aliens right now and hooked up to electronic equipment where they would kill me if I said the wrong thing right now and they said, what causes self-injurious behavior, I probably wouldn't say sexual abuse. I'd probably say parental disattunement maltreatment, which dysregulated early attachment. But that's an interesting thing because it's saying that if you had early life experiences and there was some sexual abuse or physical abuse, but your attachment years were pretty good, and we'll get to attachment in a second, you may dodge the bullet. So some of you in this room do cut on yourself statistically, and we know that, or you did at some point. Some of you didn't, but a lot of those who did or didn't in this room had bad childhood traumas. But that it, you know, how bad it is will matter, but it will also matter whether your early childhood trauma screwed up your early attachment experiences early on. So where we're really at right now is that probably the big frejoles of etiology would be early child acts of commission, like especially sexual abuse, but early acts of omission, like parental disattunement, dis disengagement, neglect, non-response, and what uh, the attachment theory is called psychological unavailability, that the parents there, but they're high or they're depressed or they're uh, battling with schizophrenia or they're on the streets and so they can't really have the time or energy to take care of a person. 